This is Sky News. It is one o'clock and we're live in Lviv with a special programme on the war in Ukraine. Another fatal shelling in Kiev with the mayor telling Sky News that attacks on civilians are deliberate. Drone footage shows the damage after parts of a missile fell on a residential area in the capital. New pictures emerge from Mariupol showing the scale of the destruction as it's confirmed 130 people have been rescued from the bombed theater in the city. But the Russian ambassador to the UN insists his country is the victim of fake news. We have this information war, which is raging much, much, on a, on a much greater scale than the than the battle than on the battlefield. And I will not be surprised at anything because who wins the, the information war? The one wins the war. But a setback for Moscow in that information war, as the broadcaster RT is stripped of its UK license. Well, hello, good afternoon. We are here at an aid distribution centre in Lviv in western Ukraine. We'll show you around in a bit, but first of all, let's bring you up to date with today's top stories. The war is now in its 23rd day, and there are further signs that Russia is faltering. Its armed forces face ongoing logistical challenges, and the Ukrainian resistance shows no sign of relenting. Well, the advance on the capital and elsewhere has stalled, according to British and US intelligence, but that raises fears over a change in tactics by Vladimir Putin as more cities and civilians face increased shelling. Well, the mayor of Lviv says several missiles hit a facility used to repair military aircraft, but work there had already been suspended. A bus repair facility was also damaged, but there are no reports of casualties so far. Sky News has verified this video and located it to a shopping mall in Mariupol, the port city near the Russian border, which has seen so much devastation. Russia's defense ministry says, with the help of separatists in eastern Ukraine, its forces are tightening the noose around Mariupol. And new footage has also emerged of the bombed theater in that city, where thousands of civilians were sheltering. Ukrainian officials say 130 people have been rescued so far, but there's still no word on casualties. Well, Russia's ambassador to the UN denies his country carried out the attack. Vasily Nebenzil was pushed on the issue by Sky's Martha Kellner. Look, uh, w what kind of atrocities are you referring to? I'm talking about narrow trenches in Mariupol with babies' bodies in. I'm talking about theatres in Mariupol being bombed by Russia. The theatre in Mariupol was not bombed by Russia. Uh, I, I spoke about it, and you may, may refer to my statement. I do not know anything about the trenches with uh, killed babies in it. I haven't seen it. AP, seen AP journalists have, have been there. I've seen so many fakes. Uh, we, we have this information war, which is raging much, much, on a, on a much greater scale than the, than, the battle, than on the battlefield. And I will not be surprised at anything, because who wins the, the information war? The one wins the war. And in Donetsk, at least four people have been killed in shelling in that city. Authorities in the self-proclaimed People's Republic say mortar rounds were fired by Ukrainian nationalists. Donetsk is one of the two regions which has been officially recognized as independent by Russia. So let's look at the other developments in Ukraine today then. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has warned foreign mercenaries considering joining Russian forces in Ukraine would be the worst decision of their life. U.S. President Joe Biden is due to speak to the Chinese President Xi Jinping around about now and is expected to warn him not to support Russia's military action. In the UK, the Homes for Ukraine scheme begins accepting applications from today uh, with Ukrainian refugees who've matched up with a sponsor in the UK. And as we heard, Ofcom has revoked the license of the Kremlin-backed broadcaster RT with immediate effect. Well, more on that last development in just a moment. But first, the British Ministry of Defence has said Russia's progress here has stalled this week. And Ukrainian forces are continuing to frustrate Putin's attempts to encircle the capital, Kiev. But the Armed Forces Minister, James Heapy, says attacks in western Ukraine are concerning.
What's going on in Mariupol is a cause for huge concern. The city is uh, under a level of barrage that is utterly terrifying and disastrous for the population that remains there. The Ukrainian MPs that visited me here in the Ministry of Defence yesterday uh, were telling me that maybe 90% of the city is, is now being uh, affected. Um, and as you say, you know, the, there are now two strikes into Western Ukraine, the air base last week and, uh, and strikes in Aviv last night. Um, so whilst there's no macro progress, we're very concerned about the suffering of the people in Mariupol and other cities that are under siege in the east, and the fact that Ukrainian supply lines are starting to be attacked in the west. Well, let's get an overview then of what has been happening on the ground here. The Russian advance has virtually stopped, but attacks continue on various cities. As we've heard, missiles hit an aircraft repair plant near here in Lviv early this morning. No casualties, though, were reported. This city is considered a relative safe haven and gateway to Europe for the thousands fleeing the war. Well, Russia's defence ministry said today that their troops are tightening the noose on Mariupol, the southern city which has been under siege for weeks now. The rescue operation at a theatre bombed there on Wednesday is still ongoing, we are told. Russians have targeted civilians all over the city, including residential areas, shopping centres and a maternity hospital. Intense fighting continues in the east. Russia has tried to link its forces from the north with those coming in from the east. Authorities reported two people killed in Kramatorsk and one in Kharkiv this morning. And explosions continued on the outskirts of the capital this morning with a residential area targeted. Well, speaking to Sky News, the mayor of Kiev said at least one person has been killed, several injured by that shelling north of the capital. The emergency services say nearly 100 people were evacuated from buildings. Our special correspondent Alex Crawford is on the ground and spoke to Vitaly Klitschko, who was visiting the site following that attack. One more fact is the war against civilians. I don't see military people here. It's no military base. It's just apartments. Apartments from civilians. Uh, a lot of attacks against civilians. Uh, one, one more example. The Russian propaganda, Russian liar. Uh, what they explain about the, some special operation, especially against uh, Ukrainian military forces. This war against civilians, against Ukra Ukrainian population. We How far had do you think... in this period, and we thought that the negotiation was going well because we had the progress. Do you think that Russians use this negotiation to reorganize, uh, to delay and to reorganize their army? Uh, I'm not involved. I'm not involved, and that's why I doesn't give a commentary for that. But uh, definitely negotiation and uh, compromise not in the price of Ukraine. Uh, we are not aggressive. We are not uh, touch anyone. We have aggressors in our uh, land and uh, aggressors killing our people. Which compromise? Which solution? I don't know. It's a very difficult uh, question. And that's why, it, I don't know. It's. Uh, uh, the question to Zelensky. What May do you feel for the next day? Do you expect more attacks, Mr. Mayor? What do you feel? Uh, it's going to stop. If you, if you, if you, it's going to be difficult. Tougher. If you look, if you look in Mariupol, if you look in Kharkiv, if you look in, in other cities, uh, Chernigiv right now, uh, where the civilian will be destroyed, the city will be destroyed. I expect the Russians do it exactly the same way in, in Kiev. Kiev. Well, let's bring in Sky's Alistair Bunkle, who's also in Lviv. And Alistair, you woken by those explosions uh, at or near the airport today. Tell us what you saw there. Yeah, I know the air raid sirens went off around 6.15 in the morning. That's become um, pretty common for us here over the last week or so. But about 15 minutes later, I counted four explosions. That's been verified uh, by authorities here. Six cruise missiles fired from the Black Sea, two of them intercepted four of them landing uh, at an aeroplane uh, uh, repair facility on the airport complex. 
Uh, we went to the airport, uh, as all airport complexes are. Uh, they are secure perimeters. It was very hard to get anywhere close by. Uh, security officials here are really on edge. Uh, they don't want people getting close to it. They don't want the media filming it and broadcasting it around the world and uh, doing any R Russian propaganda or allowing the Russians to see what damage they did. Um, but that building uh, successfully destroyed by the Russians. No injuries, no fatalities, uh, thankfully. But yet again, Lviv realises that the Russians can and will strike deep into Ukrainian territory if they want to. So, uh, you know, we've, we noticed that there was an edge this morning, if you like, to, to people as they were, as they were going to work uh, because of what happened last night. But they are determined, the people we spoke to are determined to crack on with things. They think they're winning. They think they will be victorious uh, in the end. But with the ground forces basically stalled around some of the major cities, I think the tactic from the Russians is now pretty clear, and that's what we witnessed, and that is using either long-range uh, precision-guided missiles or using... Uh, artillery at closer range that is hitting civilian buildings uh, and they don't really seem to care about it. Alistair, thank you. Well, as the war in Ukraine continues, civilians find themselves having to do things that would previously seem unthinkable. Sky News has met a family who have managed to escape from Mariupol, a city under siege facing sustained shelling from Russian forces. Well, John Sparks spoke to the Ivanovs after they had managed to escape to the city of Dnipro. These cars form a convoy of sorts, a desperate procession of people who have decided to flee. They're residents of the port of Mariupol, their home a city of death and despair. But it will require all their earthly courage to leave it. In one do-it-yourself convoy, the Ivanov family drive through the outskirts of the city, now controlled by the Russian military. Father Ivan is at the wheel. Their son Svat sits in the back. His mother, speaking for many evacuees, says life in Mariupol isn't worth living. Having failed to capture this city, the Russian military has decided to pulverize it instead. These pictures taken with the Ivanov family's camera. And the city's three-storey theatre has been targeted in a strike, this house of culture serving as a refuge as the Russians encircled the city. There were hundreds of people sheltering inside, crammed into the stalls and the corridors, these pictures taken in the theatre before the attack. The authorities say they are trying to dig survivors out of the rubble. The drama theatre was hit by a Russian strike. 1,000, possibly 1,200 people taking shelter I, inside. I think it was more, bigger, more. Initially, there was, when it started, it was 100, then it was 200, then it was more than 4,000. The city of Mariupol was badly unprepared, says Christina. There was nowhere to go, few basements to take shelter in. The family spent two weeks on the ground floor of a local school and they had no water and there was little food to go around. With no services or power, the residents of Mariupol are forced to make do. Wooden cots from a kindergarten are stripped for fuel. But it is a dangerous business, spending time outside in a city that suffers from constant shelling. And it is difficult to bury the bodies. Police, who are in the city, say, 
их сразу же потом прикапывают не глубоко, ну, чтобы типа потом перехоронить. Если умирают а, если... старики в доме, как бы, ну, у родителей как бы говорят, тоже выносите на балкон, чтобы не открывайте было, не окна, было чтобы запаха, они ну, не воняли, вывести, и не сможет, потом как-то ну. ищите машину отвозить на молитвенный дом. А, потом, а, как бы. We found the Ivanovs in the city of Dnipro, 300 kilometers to the north. They couldn't bring their loved ones with them. Their parents would not travel. Mm. But their nine-year-old boy is safe and well. Were there times where you felt scared or frightened? <laughs> no, it was followed by a yes. The battle for Mariupol continues to rage, although the Russians claim they do not target Ukrainian towns and cities. But the Ivanovs want the world to know what they've been through. И мы будем говорить, мы не будем молчать. Мариуполь не город герой, Мариуполь город смерти, ужаса и страха, где убирают сейчас люди, просто обычные люди, которые выходят за водой. Я не знаю, что нужно делать, но так не должно быть. И я прошу всех, кто может что-то сделать с этим, чтобы это остановилось. Their home is more than 300 kilometers from here, but in a way they'll never leave it. John Sparks, Sky News, in Dnipro. Well, as we've heard from places like Mariupol, they are very sh uh, short of food. Uh, there's a real need to get uh, provisions out of places like where we are in Lviv to other parts of Ukraine. And here is when many of the donations come in. That's a box of bread, we think, from Poland, uh, some crunchy dried fruit as well from Germany. This is all oats along here. And all of this will be uh, distributed, as I said, to all of those cities and towns that are in desperate need. Flour, huge bags of flour as well. Remember, uh, we reported yesterday that a food distribution centre in Kiev was also hit, it seems, by a Russian attack. Uh, camouflage as well. This will be going to the Ukrainian forces uh, on the border. This has been made by uh, volunteers um, in, in large parts of the West. All of that will be sent out to the front line, effectively. Uh, water, soft drinks, all sorts of other foods. It gets very noisy because they're packing all the time. Yes, about 250 vehicles a day leave this site to get to other parts uh, of Ukraine. But we happen to meet here uh, a man, would you believe, from South End on Sea, a hotel manager. I wonder if I could grab a quick chat with you. This is Michael J. Paul. Uh, Michael? How long have you been here for and why, why did you decide to come? Uh, I've been here for about five days now. Um, I came watching the news, seeing all the kids and the, the women, mm -hmm. even the men, in distress. Mm -hmm. Houses getting bombed, hospitals mm -hmm. getting bombed. Mm -hmm. Couldn't just sit back and uh, just watch it happen. At least I'm here trying to help, give, doing my part, and mm -hmm. uh, hopefully it's helping them. Michael, thank you very much indeed. We're going to leave you because uh, Vladimir Putin is about uh, to give a speech. This is to commemorate the anniversary for him of taking Crimea. Слово наполнено глубоким смыслом, имеет огромное значение на своей земле объединенные общие судьбы this is how the people thought and uh, that's what they uh, were guided by when they went uh, to the referendum in Sevastopol on the 18th of March in 2014. They lived and live on their own country and they wanted to uh, share the same destiny with their historical motherland, Russia, and they had the full right uh, to that and they reached their purpose. Let us congratulate, first of all, them with this occasion. It is their occasion. Congratulations. Since then, Russia did a, a lot to restore Crimea and Sevastopol. We have to do lots of things that are not visible to the naked eye, but they are of fundamental nature. Gas supplies, energy supplies, utilities, the restoration of roads, the construction of new roads and uh, motorways and the bridges. We had to bring up uh, Crimea from that humiliating situation state 
where Crimea and Sevastopol found themselves in uh, when they were part of another state and which only financed uh, Crimea with the remainder of, of, of their own uh, money. But we know what we should do now and how we should do it with what cost. And we will implement all our plans. But it's not just about those decisions. The residents of Crimea and Sevastopol did the right thing when they put up a very clear barrier to neo-Nazists and the radicals, radical nationalists, because what happened uh, on other territories and is still happening, this is the best proof of that. People who live and lived in Donbass, they also disagreed with this putsch, and straight away they organized punitive military operations against them, and more than one, and they were surrounded and they were shelled from guns. They delivered airstrikes against them. This is what we call genocide. And it is to, to save people from, from this suffering and genocide. This is the main purpose and the motive of our military operation, which we launched in Donbass and Ukraine. That's our purpose. And here I, I think about the words from the Bible. There's no more love than if somebody gave your soul for his friends. And we see how heroically and fight our guides during this, our guys during this operation. They're chanting Russia, Russia. These words, these words from the Holy Bible, our Christian Bible, from what is dear to people who profess this religion, but the heart of, of the matter is that this is a universal value for all the people people and all the confessions of Russia, and for our people, first of all, first of all, for our people. The best confirmation is how our guys are fighting and acting during this military operation, shoulder to shoulder. They are helping and supporting each other, and when it's necessary, they cover as if it was their own brother, they cover each other from the bullets. We haven't had such unity in a long time. It happened uh, uh, so that the beginning of the operation coincided uh, by accident with the birthday of one of our military leaders. Forward Russia, forward Russia. Russia forward. So there was President Putin then hailing uh, what he called the special military operation here in Ukraine at an event to mark eight years since Russia annexed uh, Crimea. Uh, he also said that he'd liberated Crimea from a humiliating conditions under Ukraine. Well, that war continues. As you can see, this is donation of medical devices to Ukrainian, Ukrainian hospitals. Looks like surgical items heading towards hospitals uh, east of where we are. It is having a devastating impact, as you know, on the people of Ukraine now. Well, here at this uh, donation centre in Lviv, it is a four-storey building, each floor stacked with emergency supplies, including clothing, medicine and toys. Um, and it helps both those cities that are in desperate need and also refugees. Let's show you around. 
Well, if you have donated something from the UK, you may wonder what happens to it. It may well have ended up here. It is an aid redistribution center uh, where some of those who are displaced from other parts of Ukraine end up and try to restock. First of all, they have to register. So let's take you through if we can uh, slightly fight our way in. Uh, this is a place that sees about 500 to 1,000 people a day. Uh, many of them, as you can see, have been, again, waiting quite a long time. So this mother and child come out. There we go. So what happens here, they straight away, they'll start registering. Little room here. This is an arts centre, in fact. It has uh, exhibitions most of the time. Set up very quickly to try to handle the large numbers of people who are desperate for everything, in fact. They will have left with just... Uh, a plastic bag, possibly, or a backpack, a wheelie bag, and that is their life's possessions inside. It's uh, fairly chaotic, as you can see. Young children as well. There is a room with, for baby food. It's a tiring process, isn't it? Natalie, it's busy today, yes? Yes, very busy. Always busy, always busy. Uh, Natalie's one of the coordinators here. So registration desk, as you can see. Cups of coffee should they require it. And then this is over four floors. And really, they've got absolutely everything here from bedding, which has been packaged up. And if you've donated something, as I said, or a charity has, or even a national government, it will come here and they will completely sort it out, resort it, package it into parcels to take to people. They'll come and they'll get some food, first of all, as you can see, just to, uh, well, a bit of sustenance having queued for absolutely ages. Uh, let me talk to uh, Yuri Popovich, actually, who is one of the lead coordinators here. Yuri, I wonder if I could grab a word. I know you're very busy. Sure. When did this place actually open, then? Well, this place opened uh, three hours after first bombing, and I was here on the second day. And what is it that you're trying to provide for people here? Well, we are trying to provide the basic necessary stuff so they can at least start rebuilding their normal life as much as it, it is possible. So that's baby food in that corner, isn't it? Right, yeah, baby food. Bedding. Yeah, some clothing. Some, because some of the people just came here without uh, shoes on, on feet of their kids. Like a fit uh, close with uh, their scarves or their sweaters uh, around their kids' feet. So we try to at least find something that would work for them. And you're also shipping stuff out to other parts of Ukraine that are in desperate need. Right, so we, we, were sh uh, we have shipped in previous weeks uh, several trucks uh, to Kharkiv, uh, Odessa, Mykolaiv, Kherson, Zhytomyr. Uh, also, we are sending every day uh, dozens of uh, vans with uh, stuff and medicine, uh, food, uh, clothing and all the different uh, aid we can provide. Yuri, thank you. Crucial work. Thank you very much thank indeed. Let's just show you the medicine, shall we, uh, down here. Uh, this is some of the stuff that we'll be going to, you know, those places he listed there, Mikolaev. And what will happen is that the different regions of Ukraine and the towns will write in to here and say what they need. So if they need some of this crucial medicine, it'll be sorted and then it will be dispatched to them. So. This is where they will get those items that those towns and cities, mainly in the east and south of Ukraine, desperately need. Yes, it really is a massive aid effort, but there are broader issues too. Uh, for example, can relations with Russia ever return to normal again, even if the war in Ukraine were to end tomorrow? We'll be discussing that after this break.
Well, just a bit of breaking news. We're hearing that the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has just come off the phone from President Zelensky. Uh, the Prime Minister reiterated his disgust at Russia's barbaric actions in Ukraine and his admiration, we're told, for the steadfast resistance of the Ukrainian people in the face of tyranny. He said the entire United Kingdom stands with Ukraine. That's the very latest from uh, Boris Johnson, the words he said to President Zelensky. Well, certainly that work continues, as you can see, that uh, resilience. This is part of the bedding that people have been donating and will be taken to those in need. Here, uh, this is all um, things like sheets and pillowcases that have been individually bagged up so people can take them. And as you can see, what a mammoth job it is inside here where people are sorting through uh, all of the stuff. Now, many of this stuff will have been donated by individuals, charities, and, in fact, national governments from Europe. So if you donated something, as I said before, this is very likely where it will end up. So it can be sorted through very carefully and given to those people in need, both those who are displaced here in Ukraine and who are making their way through to other parts of Europe. Now, uh, new data has shown that maritime trade with Russia has more than halved since the invasion of Ukraine began three weeks ago. One financial data provider registered a 55% drop in ships bound for Russia since the end of February. It follows the imposition of a series of damaging sanctions by Western countries. But let's talk more. Joining me now is Ed Gresser, Vice President and Director for Trade and Global Markets at the Progressive Policy Institute. Great to have you on. I mean, you see the massive task where we are here to deal with the, the fallout uh, from Russia's invasion. The other fallout, of course, is the impact on Russia. So are these sanctions beginning to bite? Uh, yeah, I think they're beginning to bite pretty hard. Uh, we're hearing about um, auto plants closing down. We're hearing about Russia's uh, banks being cut off from financial flows, Russia being cut out of the uh, international currency arrangements. Uh, the trade data don't come in in the United States to Europe for several months after it actually happens. So what we have now is anecdotal shots, but um, this is mm -hmm. the largest and most coordinated imposition of sanctions on any major country um, since probably the 1950s, um, setting aside a couple of small, smaller cases of Iraq and Iran. So this is very significant and it will have a big impact. Yes, we've seen um, sanctions placed on other countries like Iran. You know, is this significantly different? And if so, will it have a very different impact as well? I mean, wh what will the end result be for Russia? Um, well, the end result ultimately depends on the choices of the Russian government, presumably. But what we've had now is a, you know, a fairly coordinated set of financial and trade and logistical and personal sanctions on Russia. Russia has been cut off from most of the world's uh, financial flows. Most of Russia's major trading partners have revoked uh, their most favored nation status. We in the United States have imposed uh, import bans on energy and a, a number of other products. Uh, a lot of individual Russian um, you know, business executives and government officials have been personally sanctioned. Uh, I have read that Russia had about $600 billion in foreign reserves um, put aside to prepare for an event like this, and they had lost um, about $400 billion of those as they had placed them in Western um, financial institutions. So, yes, this is across the board. This is uh, covering most aspects of the Russian economy. Uh, it uh, includes not only the United States, UK, EU, but also Japan and Korea and a number of other Asian and Pacific countries. So it is uh, a remarkable um, effort, not only in the spectrum and scope of the sanctions, but in the coordination across most of the world's uh, developed countries. Uh, the issue, of course, is by squeezing them, are we squeezing ourselves? You know, how badly will we in the West be hit? Um, I think it depends on where you live. Uh, we in the United States are not very exposed to the Russian economy. Um, they make up about 1% of U.S. imports and about a, a third of a percent of exports. So U.S. will have to do a bit of adjustment. We have to find some alternate sources of palladium and of um, fertilizer inputs and things like that. But those are very localized and, and not systemic issues. U.K. is a little bit more exposed, uh, not very much. The Continental Europe is um, 
reliant on Russia, obviously, for energy, um, particularly for natural gas, which is hard to find from alternative sources. So um, continental Europe will have to be dealing with uh, the effects of um, potential Russian um, on their electricity and power. And that's a big adjustment. Otherwise, Russia will suffer uh, US, EU, UK, Asian countries, not, not nearly as much. Still there? Yes, Ed Gress, I was starting to vaguely lose you there. I do apologise. Just one quick question, if you don't mind. If there is a ceasefire, how long should these sanctions continue? Should they be curtailed as an act of goodwill, do you think? Um, pretty I'm not hearing you. I'm not hearing you either. I think we better call it... We we, we better call it a day. Ed Gresser, thank you very much indeed. Both of us are struggling to hear each other from the Progressive Policy Institute. Well, let's get uh, a little more on those extraordinary pictures we just saw of President Putin. Uh, let's take you straight to Alistair Bunkle, reacting to those pictures, speaking to a large crowd in central Moscow. Um, and this, of course, all to mark the anniversary of Crimea. Um, you know, we, we thought he was kind of stuck in his bunker at the Kremlin, Alistair, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, we've come used to seeing President Putin sitting one end of a very long table and either uh, his senior security figures sitting at the other end or any foreign leaders who have visited him. We uh, have come used to him being paranoid about catching COVID and not wanting to be close to anybody. But now we see him out and about uh, at a stadium in Moscow with thousands of people waving uh, the Russian flag to mark the capturing and the annexation of Crimea, which happened back in 2014. Now, look, I, I very much doubt that it's by mistake, by coincidence, that Vladimir Putin is being seen to be out and about. Um, as closed off as he might be to much of the world, uh, I'm sure he can't have failed to realise that uh, continually sitting in a bunker uh, gives the impression of a bunker mentality. And so he wants to try and prove that the Russian people are behind him and behind his, what, well, what he describes as the special operation inside Ukraine. He's been praising that operation, saying that it's going successfully. But it is an operation, it is an invasion, it is a war that has so far yet failed to comprehensively take and hold a city. They have failed to even encircle the capital, Kiev. They failed to unseat the government of President Zelensky. They have lost four of their major generals uh, on the front line, plus thousands of other troops and a lot of equipment as well. And this was supposed to be one of the most fearsome, one of the most powerful military forces in the world. So the facts bear out. The operation, the conflict, the invasion is not going well for Russia at all. The Ukrainians are putting up a resistance. And President Putin has given no indication that he's necessarily aware of that. But one assumes that he must be. But this message is a message for his people. He has shut down much of independent media within Russia. He shut down access to foreign media, social media. And so this is the message, this is the spin that he's putting on the conflict to the Russian people. Alistair, updating us there. Thank you very much indeed. So Joe Biden speaking to Xi Jinping. The big question, can China be persuaded to use its influence over Russia's President Vladimir Putin? Back with that after this.
a journalist might want in a story. A story that you'd be proud to have filmed. But they didn't want journalists to see the real story. It was very tiring, it was very sad, it was very scary at times. Hey, there's no need for this. But you have to keep going. Oh, yoy, yoy. look at that. You don't want to lecture people, but you do have to give them the fact. I'm David Blevins, and I'm Sky's senior Ireland correspondent. I'm based in Belfast, a city transformed by peace, but still struggling with its past. Now, the US President Joe Biden is currently on a call with his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping. Among other things, Joe Biden is expected to push for Xi not to help Russia in its military operation in Ukraine. Well, joining me now is Robert Daly, former diplomat at the US Embassy in Beijing and director of the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, first direct talks, I understand, since November. So what does America need to tell to China? President Biden will tell President Xi that if he supports Russia, either through uh, providing military equipment or helping it evade sanctions, that there will be a serious price to pay for China. So he is going to essentially uh, threaten and cajole Xi Jinping, and at the same time, will be trying to encourage him to use his offices uh, to temper Russia's actions. The problem is, if you threaten and cajole China in the same meeting, uh, China tends to feel more threatened than cajoled, and it will bite back. Now, your uh, view, uh, I've seen from, uh, from what you've tweeted, is that China is too tied into the global economy to risk helping Russia. The problem is that is it presumes we are up for punishing them if they do. Exactly. So we are, we are threatening China essentially with secondary sanctions. But any secondary sanctions that we impose that China would feel, we, and by we I mean the rest of the world, including the United States, would also feel heavily because we're very integrated. And so the broad context for the Xi-Biden uh, meeting is, is the United States uh, going to remain integrated with China? Is China going to remain integrated with Europe and, and with the West? So there's both the narrow question about Ukraine and what China does or doesn't do, and the broader question about China's relations with the rest of the world and whether decoupling will continue. So there are several layers to this discussion. They tried to, as you know, uh, you know, follow a neutral path, haven't they? Um, but do you, do you think diplomatic tightrope walkers eventually fall off? And which way, if they do, will they fall? If China feels that it has to fall one way or the other, then China stands with Russia. It has already made that clear. And China made a decision during the first year of the Biden administration which disappointed them in many ways. They were hoping for a rollback of the Trump policy toward China, and they didn't get it. China has made a decision that the United States does wish to contain China, that really our uh, China policy is one of regime change. And so China will defensively stand with Russia, but it will maintain the fiction of neutrality for as long as it can. And even if the United States and much of the rest of the world says to China, you clearly stand with Russia, they will continue to say to their own people, to themselves, to the world, no, uh, we are neutral, we are impartial, uh, we stand for peace. How do help us understand how the Chinese actually think? You know, are they looking at the the new world order? You know, closer partnership with Russia, or do you think the Chinese people and indeed the Chinese government actually have some sympathy with the people here in Ukraine who are suffering so badly in many places? Well, first, I think there's a great deal of sympathy for the people in Ukraine. We have to remember that China has, and has had for a while, a good relationship with Ukraine. They buy a lot of corn and wheat from Ukraine. Their Belt and Road infrastructure projects go through Ukraine. China's one operative aircraft carrier is a second-hand uh, purchase from Ukraine. The people of China, uh, of course, aren't hearing a lot of what we're hearing in the West. They're not seeing the footage. China controls that. But there is certainly sympathy from the Chinese people uh, for, for people in Ukraine. How the government sees this is a different question. The master narrative is that the West is in decline and the East is rising. So China sees the trend lines 
as being in its favor. It thinks the American-led West is clinging to what remains of its hegemony in a dangerous and deluded way. And so they are playing uh, the longer game. And in that, Ukraine is a piece, but only a piece. So they're not hyper-focused on it the way that we are in the West. Well, it's fascinating geopolitics at the highest level, isn't it? Robert Daly, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, we've just had a statement from the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky. Let's listen in. Of the unbreakable country. This is day 23 of our patriotic war. After eight years of the war in the East, the occupiers uh, keep uh, burn their national wealth in, uh, on the war in Ukraine. They will destroy everything that uh, Russian society has uh, reached over the past 25 years, and they will return where they began to rise into the. Uh, into the uh, 90s, only after uh, hopes of millions of people to work for the development of their country. So this will be the result of the war against Riquet. This will be a painful fall, and they feel that uh, even, even against the opium for the people delivered by uh, propaganda peddlers, wars are always uh, uh, expensive, especially uh, uh, the price is high for the aggressor. But uh, whatever happens, this will not uh, resurrect our dead people, it will not uh, uh, rebuild our cities and it will not erase the pain in our hearts that will always remain. Uh, I have no doubt we will build everything, will become a full member of the United Nations. Each representative of our country works on that 24-7, but life will have changed forever uh, uh, because of uh, so many hearts that have stopped because of this war eternal memory for all those who have given their life for Ukraine. The Russian troops have continued uh, pounding our peaceful communities and, and, and towns. Uh, Kharkov, Chernigov, Sumy, uh, the towns of Donbass, Severodonetsk, Kramatorsk, Mariupol, Ma missile strikes and uh, aviation bombs, we try to shoot them down as much as we can. We destroy their planes, we destroy their helicopters, accounting for the fact that we still don't have uh, adequate uh, anti-missile advanced weapons. Uh, we don't have enough uh, fighter planes, but our plane is to defend our people, our country. And we will continue everything we can do, and we will uh, re keep reminding some uh, Western leaders that it will be a moral reproach uh, to them. It will make them uh, ashamed that uh, Ukraine hasn't received uh, uh, the advanced weapons that it needs to defend uh, thousands of, uh, of the lives of our people. Some. I have uh, lots of negotiations today. Ursula von der Leyen, Charles Michel, uh, the chairman of the European Council, uh, John Johnson, uh, our great friend. The agenda is understandable, of course. It's the concrete steps which will give Ukraine a, a more uh, uh, force, but also for the economy and for uh, the Ukrainians who are now and, and here are defending Europe on our land. Uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, pro promised to do everything she can to expedite the process of uh, Ukraine joining the EU. The processes uh, that normally take years, it will be shortened for our country to weeks and months. It's not easy, but we will do that. We have also agreed that we will receive support uh, from the EU for the Ukrainians who have to leave their countries because of the war, those who are abroad and inside our country. We have also agreed on another 300 million uh, euro for Ukraine uh, on top of what has been agreed before. We will also discuss a new sanctions against Russia so that they will feel that each missile against our state, each bomb, each uh, uh, shot has a price. And for the Russian budget, for Russian companies, for Russian am ambitions and for uh, uh, individuals, Russian individuals who represent the Russian authorities. And until uh, Ukraine has peace, the sanctions against Russia have to become stronger. And, uh, for, uh, the, uh, and for the people, 
people who propose that uh, uh, that uh, uh, restrictions should be uh, res uh, restricted not just for the country but also for certain uh, uh, communities. And the Swedish uh, dockers refuse to service Russian ships, and everybody should follow this example. All communities and, and trade associations. If we don't stop Russia now, if we don't punish Russia now, other aggressors in the world will start other wars in other regions, on other continents, everywhere where this or that country hopes to subjugate their neighbors. We have to act now so that uh, any potential aggressors can see that uh, wars only bring losses and no profits, uh, so that it's necessary that all Europeans should block ports for all Russian ships, that all Russian commercial ships will be uh, will follow that Russian uh, that proverbial Russian military ship. The, all Western companies should uh, leave the Russian market and shouldn't use PR, cheap PR, uh, to cover up uh, uh, their money uh, for uh, war crimes like uh, Oshan or Nestle are doing. Uh, we have agreed humanitarian corridors uh, in uh, several regions. Uh, Sumy, uh, uh, Konotop, uh, Velika Pisarivka, uh, uh, and, uh, and it's very difficult to arrange a, a corridor from uh, uh, Mariupol to Zaporizhia. The Occupy is doing everything to stop a humanitarian Ukrainian uh, uh, humanitarian convoys to the city. Uh, this is terror. We are doing everything we can. We have also rescued 35,000 people from uh, Mariupol. We continue rescue work at the site of the uh, blown up uh, theater. Uh, the occupiers blew it up, even though people were hiding there. We have, in total, saved 130 uh, people, but uh, much more people are still under the rubble, and we will continue rescue work. The situation is very difficult in Kharkov region. The occupiers continue trying to destroy our city of Izum. I turn to people in Balaklaya. Our team is doing everything to set up an active humanitarian corridor to those towns and to deliver water, food and medications. I have instructed the cabinet and the speaker of the parliament to create such a format for decision so that it can provide all the necessary goods from abroad, such as fuel, food and all the other goods that will uh, answer to the basic needs of society. This is no time for bureaucrats and uh, uh, ambitious people stop and, and benefit from uh, the needs of the people. We will speed up uh, customs clearance of all the goods that are so needed for Ukrainians. If we have to uh, we have to tax those uh, uh, goods, uh, uh, and if we have to, to discipline uh, customers, uh, customs officials, then we'll do that. Our borders must be open to everything that's needed for Ukrainians. I expect uh, adequate decisions until the end of today, and also the, then the answer from MIMPs, because everybody has to work today only for Ukrainians, uh, for uh, our country and people, not for their own ambitions and for bureaucracy. Everything has has to be focused on the defense of Ukraine. I have signed um, order to to award uh, uh, state awards to 138 uh, orders, uh, and is a list of the officers. Uh, the, he, he, the, the commander of the defense of Kiev, because of his uh, resolute actions, uh, losses were inflicted on the enemy. Since the beginning uh, of the uh, defense of Kiev, uh, more than 30 towns were released, uh, liberated uh, uh, outside Kiev. Uh, Major Taras Leonidovich Mazarok, commander of a tank battalion, he defended Donetsk region, he inflicted uh, tangible losses to the enemy and stopped uh, its uh, advance. Uh, 
uh, an order for ca courage is awarded to uh, Roslana Vasilina, uh, 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 senior uh, medic. She took part in, in saving uh, the wounded from uh, Mariupol. Thanks to her actions, uh, 31 uh, uh, troops were saved. She continues working in Mariupol. Glory to all our heroes. Glory to Ukraine. Well, Volodymyr Zelensky there talking about the needs of the Ukrainian people, including in places like Mariupol. 25,000 people, he said, had been freed from there. And talking about that theatre, which we know was bombed, 130 have been rescued. And it is in this place that those needs are being met, including, as you can see, for children. The toys that people like you at home have donated end up here, and they are distributed throughout Ukraine and for refugees who are fleeing. And certainly we know that the movement of people towards the Polish border has slowed. It was about 100,000 a day. It's now dropped to 50,000 a day, but that's still huge numbers of people. Let's take you in here to another auditorium. This is where they've been gathering and uh, sorting clothes uh, again for children, especially warm ones. It's been really cold for people. Hats, gloves, socks, all gathered here, all sorted and boxed up. And all of these people are working 24-7, trying to make sure people get the things they need. Volodymyr Zelensky saying they're also working 24-7 too to become a member of the European Union. The dream of NATO membership by, might end, but not that dream of uh, being a member of the European Union. So displaced people, uh, now three and a quarter million, have departed. Two million, million extra are displaced in Ukraine itself. And in places like here, they're trying to provide food, sustenance, clothing, bedding, everything they need to try to rebuild their life, which has been so badly damaged by that Russian invasion, which began three weeks ago. Our coverage continues, of course, coming up in the next hour. Bel Donati will take you through all of the day's news from Lviv. We'll see you later. Well, as uh, Anna said, this is Sky News, the top stories at 2 p.m. Kiev under attack, another fatal shelling in the capital, with the mayor telling Sky News that attacks on civilians are deliberate. How many mistakes they do it? How many civilians have to kill? And after that, to explain about mistake. Destruction and devastation in Mariupol as 130 survivors are pulled from the rubble of a bombed theater in the city. Meanwhile, in Moscow, President Putin...